It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is the one and only Mark Schaefer, and we're going to be discussing his brand new book, Cumulative Advantage, How to Build Momentum for Your Ideas, Business, and Life Against All Odds. Mark, I always look forward to speaking with you. Welcome back to the show. It is great to talk to you, Sean, as always. Well, I don't want to get into a full origin story, uh, but in terms of somebody seeing you, listening to you for the first time in this interview, give us like the elevator pitch version of who is Mark Schaefer. Yeah, spent uh, more than 20 years in corporate America, worked in marketing for a Fortune 100 company, started my own business, started creating content that led to writing books, which led to public speaking. Uh, I, my, my real sweet spot is strategy consulting. And uh, I also teach at, uh, at Rutgers University. That is a, a very succinct uh, version of your story. But uh, yeah. again, if, you, if people want to find out more, listen to some of our previous episodes, I'll link to those. Mark goes a bit more at length in some of our earlier conversations. Um, I, I think uh, the place I'd love to go next would just be to have you speak briefly to uh, it kind of never being too late to get into a scene. You might lose some of that timing for somebody that got in early. But, I, you know, one of the things I think you've dealt with is maybe some people thought you were too old for some of the spaces you've been playing. <laughs> uh, I think they still think that. <laughs> well, uh, I'll tell you something. Um, so I started my business when in 2008. So I would have been, I uh, guess, uh, 48 years old. Started blogging when I was uh, in 2009. So it would have been you know, about 49. And I just didn't know any better. Uh, you know, I was endless, endlessly fascinated by the social media space. And one of the things I observed was that most of the bloggers back then really didn't have any significant business experience. The early social media bloggers, they were working in customer service or in sales, or uh, maybe they were working for an agency or something. But I had just had this amazing career working in global marketing and e-business and product development. And so I had sort of a different voice. It was a voice of experience that seemed to resonate with people. And um and, and that really was probably my initial advantage in, for, in terms of creating my momentum that led to my personal brand is that I was a bit uh, unique in that way. And I didn't really study anybody. I, I didn't know what I was doing wrong. I just followed my own path. And I think that was probably refreshing for a lot of people. And I mentioned in the book that, uh, you know, uh, Mitch Joel, who's uh, certainly a thought leader in our field, you know, just told me outright, he said, I didn't think you were going to make it. I thought you were just too late. You were too old. There were already too many bloggers out there. And uh, But again, I just didn't know any better and stuck with it. Um, you know, I, I had a streak where I blogged uh, 650 weeks in a row without ever missing. I've had a podcast now for nine years, never missed an episode. And it's more than consistency. I also really push for something that's meaningful and something that's relevant. Uh, whenever I publish content, there's only one thing in my mind, and it's I will never let you down. It's, you're gonna, it's gonna be worth it. It's gonna be worth your time if you read my blog, listen to my show, read my books. And that's been the formula that's uh, helped me last, I think, despite my age. <laughs> Well, I certainly, you know, what comes to mind with what you just shared, consistency pays off over time. Uh, you eventually seem to be kind of a, a pillar in a scene, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also love the the element of kind of carving your own path. Sometimes we get all giddy and excited and we jump into stuff not knowing any better. But often that's great in the sense that we don't try to copy everybody else. We just carve our own path. We, we kind of go our own way uh, and create something new and unique. Every scene needs unique, new, fresh contributions. And so when we're not all copying each other, I feel like that's when some amazing stuff happens. Uh, in terms of the new book, Mark, I was super excited and curious when I started, I, I started reading and then I listened to the audio book. So I both, I bought two copies of your book just because oh, I love great. you that much. Um, 
But why Tim Ferriss? I was fascinated for you to go down this path of kind of contrasting the Mark Schaefer journey with the Tim Ferriss journey. Both both you and Tim, I've pretty much read all of your books. I've listened to tons of content from both of you. So very interesting to me as a marketing guy who's consumed tons of content from both you and Tim to have you go this path. Well, what I was trying to do is in my research for this book, which is uh, about momentum. How do we build momentum for our ideas, our lives, and our businesses? And so I was going deep, deep, deep into academic research. I was starting to do even some of my own original research. And then I, I needed case studies for the book. So um, I actually had probably three or four chapters already written. And um, I was looking for people who were sort of improbable successes. So I started reading biographies of different uh, celebrities uh, that I could sort of tease out how did these patterns of momentum show up in their lives? And then I don't know, it was maybe a whim, who knows? Perhaps it was divine intervention. I started reading about Tim Ferriss and it just didn't make sense. He didn't have anything that would make you predict that the guy was gonna be a success. And I chronicle in the book sort of what his early life was up until the age of 29 when he published his first book. And this is nothing that Tim hasn't talked about himself. It's been very transparent, but he was having financial difficulties. He was driving an old clunker. He was having mental health problems, physical health problems, financial problems with his business. He, and then finally, he was overworked, stressed out, working this uh, unsustainable hustle lifestyle, lost his longtime girlfriend, and he just chucked it all, went to Europe, trying to figure out what do I do? Where did I go wrong? There's got to be a better way. And while he was there, he had this idea for a book, which was rejected 26 times until someone took a risk on him. So if you were a Las Vegas odds maker at that point and said, okay, Tim Ferriss and Mark Schaefer are both writing their first books right about the same time. Who would you predict 10 years later would be hanging out with LeBron James, Hugh Jackman, and Oprah? the smart money would be on me. And yet it's Tim against all odds. It just appears there's nothing going for the guy. And here was the thing that was absolutely unbelievable, really. Maybe it was unbelievable. Maybe it was predictable in a way. But if you look at this pattern of momentum, it fit his world exactly. He did exactly what this research would, would predict. He didn't know it. Uh, nobody really does. You sort of fall into it. But these things have ha kind of happen in sequence, usually, that can help you build this momentum. And now the guy, it's just everything he touches turns to gold. And he has this unstoppable momentum. But, you know, what, at the age of, uh, at the age of 29, he had really nothing going for him. <laughs> His idea was rejected 26 times. And against all odds, he's become a media celebrity. I, I think one thing I'd love to have you comment on first, and this is a little bit of a side trail, but uh, you know, Tim is somebody who is very uh, self-examining. He's constantly trying to iterate and make himself better. So, I mean, we've all got, had the benefit of him reflecting on his wins, his losses, the changes he's made. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like it often can take somebody outside of the bubble of somebody's journey to tease out or see some of the, the themes or the patterns. Um, but I find one of the challenges of talking to people who've experienced massive success uh, on the successful side of things, uh, they often struggle with hindsight bias where they can't remember right. or they, they're, they're so disconnected from the time when things weren't going well. Um, yeah. So talk a little bit about that in terms of as we talk with or try to learn from others why we just need to be aware of hindsight bias. Well, it's a very interesting topic. And, and in the book, I refer to this research by a fellow named Richard Sandel. He's a professor at Harvard University. And he points to hindsight bias. I'm not sure if he actually used that word, but that is certainly the topic of his writing. Uh, he points to this 
as a, a reason for much of the polarization and toxic, toxicity in America today. And the story sort of goes like this. So in America and in much of the Western world, we sort of have this idea that here's the American dream. If you work hard and you, you know, keep your nose clean, play your cards right, anyone can success, pull yourself up from the bootstraps. This is America. You can do anything. And so that is a pervasive myth in our culture. It's a pervasive narrative, let's say. It's in TV shows, it's in movies, it's celebrated. And the implication is that the people who have done that or seemingly have done that become our heroes. And the people who seemingly have not been able to do that are looked down upon and, and they feel humiliated. But what I show in the book, and again, this isn't just my idea, there's a lot of research around this, that almost all success, every successful person, every successful business starts with a random idea, something random. It was luck. You saw something, you did something, you heard something, you met somebody, you took a class, you read a book, you heard a speech, something changed your view. Now, you had the curiosity and the drive and the persistence to pursue that, create something, build something, and, and look, hard work, the intelligence, making good decisions still matters. But what we don't really talk about in our culture is that a lot of what has happened to us comes from luck. There's a statistic in the book that I think is rather chilling that they showed that children who are grown in poverty have an average IQ of 77. They don't have enough to eat. They, you know, that maybe they live in some state of fear. Uh, they're probably not getting enough sleep, probably not getting good nutrition. Children who are adopted into a, a healthier, safe environment have an average increase in IQ from 77 to 92. Just being raised in a safe place is the number one predictor of IQ. That can be seen as an advantage. I grew up in a safe house. I never had to worry about food. I had two parents. I had friends to play with. I never felt like I didn't fit in. Uh, so those are really subtle things that build momentum. Advantage builds on advantage. Advantage leads to advantage. And that is the part of the narrative that we really don't talk about in America. We j and it's not fun talking about it because it's a lot more fun for me to talk about my struggle, the hero's journey. That's sexy. That's interesting. That uh, makes people admire me rather than to say, oh, you know what, <laughs> you know, honestly, if this hadn't happened to me when I was in high school, <laughs> I probably would have been a dropout, you know, blah, 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 blah. And that's how it is for most people. And, and so I'm glad you picked up on that because I think it's one of the more interesting parts of the book. It was quite a fascinating rabbit hole to go down for me. Yeah, I find often if you really dig and go deep into almost anybody's journey, um, we like to portray ourselves on on the hero's journey as the hero yeah. who slayed the dragon and did the thing and had the success. But more often than not, there is often a person or several people in that person's timeline that mentored them, helped them, saw some kind of potential in them and just gave them an opportunity or opened up doors and relationships that that was the thing that scaled. I mean, so often people work and toil year after year and they're stuck. And then it's that one relationship that magically opens the door. Yeah. Uh, I, I find that's a common denominator in almost every success story. Yes, yeah. And and so that is, you're starting to hint at the, this pattern that I talk about in the book. And one of the things that I feel quite confident in saying is that after you read the book, you'll never see the world again. Because when you listen to people's stories and you, you hear about the founder's story of a business, let's say, you'll start to hear that pattern. You'll say, oh, okay, that fits what Schaefer wrote about in his book. Yep, that was, that was an advantage. He, you know, this person pursued this. 
that there was a there was a trend. The time was right, and then this is how they became known in their field. Here's some help that they got along the way, and, and so th this pattern just repeats endlessly. And I think the value this book brings is once you're aware of it, you can start thinking about what it means to you, what where you might be falling down. And also, it, I think it'll help you be aware of the new opportunities that are opening up all around you all the time. It's constant. And I think if you start seeing how momentum works and see how this pattern interconnects, I think people will be uh, more successful selling new ideas, creating new businesses, building personal brands. Uh, you talked about curiosity uh, a little while ago in the conversation. Uh, I'd love to talk, have you talk a little bit now about recognizing patterns. Now, I, I came up in the tech support world, running call centers and coaching support agents. So our whole job was like finding patterns. And so that's something I do really easily, but not everybody thinks like that. So what, why is the ability to recognize patterns sometimes important? You know, I, I think you're. I think you're right. Um, uh, I mentioned in the book that I had a, a great, great thrill by getting to meet and interview uh, Walter Isaacson. It was m memorable for a number of reasons. The, unfortunately, something that overwhelmed even my opportunity to meet Walter Isaacson is that I, I was at South by Southwest, so I was scheduled to sit down and talk with him. He had just finished his speech. We were sitting there, we were beginning our conversation and all of a sudden this place started just blasting ear splitting music. We couldn't even hear each other. You know, we could barely keep our conversation going. So that was uh, quite weird. But you know, here's the guy that wrote the definitive biographies on Steve Jobs. They made it into a movie, uh, Albert Einstein. Benjamin Franklin, Leonardo da Vinci. And I asked him, what is the common thread that defines this genius? And he said, number one, recognizing patterns. And number two is endlessly pursuing curiosity. He said, those two combinations really, that's what creates genius. And uh, I, I, I don't think you need to have that advantage uh, you know, the initial advantage that leads to momentum can be encouragement. It can be money. It can be an education. It could be a connection. I, I use the example of Bill Gates. The reason Bill Gates became Bill Gates wasn't because of money or anything special in his education. When he was a teenager, he had access to the first computer prototypes. He was coding computers before anyone else in his generation. That was initial advantage. What was the opportunity? What was shifting? Coding, computers, software. He was right there at the beginning. He knew more about it than any other person his age. And then he pursued that curiosity. He burst through that seam and drove it hard and made good decisions to sustain that, that momentum. So um, yeah, recognizing patterns, pursuing curiosity, uh, those are big advantages, but but you don't really need to have those advantages to build momentum. In terms of, you know, we find a scene that we want to be a part of, which a lot of us, you know, professionally, there's spaces that we work in quite regularly or we're going to spend a lot of time in. Is there any way we can position ourselves to nurture those random events that make the difference or nurture uh, what we're doing in a way to try to take hold of the right timing. Obviously, a lot of those things are uh, out of our control, but I feel like there are ways that we can position, our, position ourselves to be poised to take advantage of those situations when they present themselves. Well, absolutely. And again, the key, and this is, uh, there's lots of interesting case studies in the book around these uh, random events that create success. And, and the research that I think is very compelling is in a book called The Click Moment by Franz Johansson. It sounds like an SEO book or something, but it's not. It's actually a lot more interesting than that. And what Johansson shows very compellingly is that success almost always starts with something random, just seeing something new, being in a new city. So the idea, and it's really this simple, 
is to put yourself in situations to see, to have more random connections. Um, talking to new people, being in new places, sharing new ideas. Um, one of the things that I miss is my biggest random generate random idea generator was a was a big uh, conference called South by Southwest that occurs every year in Austin, Texas. And this is basically a, a, a global meeting of thought leaders. And it, it, it's it's not just tech, it's environment, it's e-commerce, it's sustainability, it's fashion, it's music, uh, it's design. It, it, and, and so you have this incredible mashup of brilliant people. And just sitting beside somebody at lunch is going to just blow your mind uh, because there's so many interesting people there. And what I would do is force myself to go to sessions I would never go to in my normal life. It could be something about robotics. It could be something about uh, how artificial intelligence is being used at nonprofits. And I would just try to get so much variety and I would have so many ideas coming out of that week. It would fuel me for a year. Now, I think that's one of the problems we have right now in a pandemic where we're not having those random sort of events. Even in a situation like this, here we are. You know, I'm glad to see you, Sean. What a fine guy. You're a bright guy. But this is kind of typical. We have our day. We have our Zoom meetings. And we want to get off those Zoom meetings and get to the next one. And we're not really building in time for randomness. And so one of the things I'm doing is actually trying to do that. I'm, I, I, I'm using this service that matches you up with random business people. And you could just talk about what's going on in your world. And I found some new ideas. I found some new collaborators to work with. And uh, we, we need to find ways to inject random, randomness into our daily lives, or we're going to be walking into the death valley of creativity. Uh, next, Mark, I'd love to have you comment on some of what you cover in the book about creating a sonic boom. Now, as a guy who works in the book publishing space and marketing, you know, the that rhythm of like six to eight weeks of intense focus uh, to get the word out, that's really normal. Uh, but, but you give an example of uh, Tim Ferriss's launch of the 4-Hour Workweek, where he focused all of his efforts into this massive, epic, one week, you know, everything yeah. just launch right when the book was available. Uh, right. Just right. talk to us a little about why a sonic boom could be effective and, and how that ties to the social proof necessity of people making decisions to choose us in this era where there's limitless possibilities. Well, to me, that was the most fun part of the book. If you're a marketing geek, you're going to love it because I talk about some some new research or at least some lesser known research about how ideas really spread. And I think one of the more important ideas is something that we all probably know about or have heard about, but it's so easy to overlook is this idea of social proof. So social proof is when we don't have the truth. We look around our environment to provide clues as to what to do. A really simple example is, let's say um, you're at a football game and the game's over and you need to find the exit. You don't really know where the exit is, but everybody's kind of going one direction. So you go. So you're using the clues of the environment to make a decision when you don't really have the facts. We do that all the time. And one of the problems that marketers face is they assume that an individual makes a decision to buy or not buy or to subscribe or not subscribe in a vacuum. When in fact, they almost always gather data in the form of social proof, especially if the purchase or the commitment is let's say over a couple hundred dollars. They're always gonna look at reviews or testimonies they're going to maybe ask their friends. They'll put something out on social media. So this idea of social proof is really important. And there's a fascinating case study in the book where researchers were able to manipulate the popularity of songs based on 
social proof. There's, there's, there's even a case study out there that indicates Justin Timberlake's entire career might have been manipulated by social proof. Now, I love Justin Timberlake. I think he's an incredibly talented person, but there's a lot of talented people out there. And it shows that one way to build momentum is to pay attention to social proof. It's, it's, it can be much more powerful and influential than you imagine. And Mark, uh, it's almost time for us to wrap up, but the last place I wanna go is have you comment on the importance of finding a mentor. And sometimes we're mentored by people directly. Sometimes that's virtually through their books and their podcasts and other things, but also uh, the importance of being a mentor to other people. I feel like we're always in places where we need mentorship, but we have things to give to others. Well, uh, something that had a profound impact on me uh, when I was writing the book is having this realization that momentum does start from these sparks, these unexpected things, these random opportunities. And it always starts there. And so we have so many problems in our society and there's so many gaps in wealth and in income and in health and in commerce and in upward mobility. And it just seems overwhelming. And one idea I had is that what if we sort of applied this pattern to the real world, not just our lives, not just our ideas, not just our business, but what if we all committed to create sparks for others? It doesn't take much time. It's something that's doable. It's accessible. We can all encourage someone. We can make an introduction for someone. We can help them with, we can give them ideas on a, on a podcast. We can listen to them. I mean, one of the things I, I never say no to requests from high school kids, college kids, because you just never know what's going to inspire somebody and send a ripple through the world in a positive direction. So I take advantage of those opportunities every time they come along. And I think if we start thinking about this pattern of momentum, not just for ourselves, but how it can show up in others, maybe we can have a little impact on the world. And Mark, big picture reader's journey with the book. Uh, if they take away one thing, like what's that core idea you want every single reader to grasp from the pages of this book? I, I, I would, my wish would be that they know that this is a book of tremendous hope because there's nothing in this book that is not accessible and doable by anyone. We all have random moments. We all are looking in our environment to see how our ideas might uh, uh, apply in this world. We can certainly learn to be more disciplined about pursuing our curiosity, about seeking help when we need it. And, and so you, you don't need a million dollars. You don't need an Ivy League education to build momentum for whatever you believe in. And so that is, the, that is I think, the major value of this book uh, when it was completed is that, look, um, this is a book that really is, should be accessible by anyone. Well, I think I say this every time I speak with Mark, uh, but I believe this will probably be one of the most important marketing and I would say personal development books you could read in 2021. It nicely rides that fence. If you're in the marketing space, you're going to find a lot here. If you're just looking to grow as an individual or whatever scene it is you're operating in, I think this book has a lot to offer you. Mark, as far as people connecting with you, finding out more about the work you do, your podcast, your many books and resources, where can we discover you on the web? It's very easy. If you can remember businessesgrow.com, you can find my blog, you can find my podcast, my books, all my social media connections. And I'd love to hear from all your listeners and hopefully connect with them. And like we do with every episode, we'll have links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Mark and pick up your very own copy of his brand new book. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Mark Schaefer. Once again, our book today was Cumulative Advantage, How to Build Momentum for Your Ideas, Business, and Life Against All Odds. For and Mark and his books, head over to his website. You can find that at businessesgrow.com. And Mark, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's always a joy. It's always an honor to have you on the show. Thanks so much, Sean.